Hello, everyone, and welcome to the week ahead. We start this week with um, some, you know, subtle undercurrents within a larger shifting environment. Um, I've been thinking a lot about the shift of Pluto into Aquarius. And of course, this has been spoken about by many astrologers. And I think there's a lot of different ways um, to interpret any planetary movement. But the things that are relevant for me relative to this cycle have been pointing me back to well, when was the last time that this was happening, right? This it's 2024. Um, today's January 14th as I'm making this video. And the last time that Pluto moved into Aquarius was in the 1700s. So between 17, um, 77, 1779, it formally went into Aquarius. Like it did the same back and forth dance that we've been doing the last two years. Last year, Pluto went into Aquarius, then retrograded back into Capricorn. It's still in Capricorn. It will enter Aquarius in the next days here in the next couple of days. And then it will again later on this year retrograde back into Capricorn uh, before finally moving into Aquarius November 19th. And for good, for you know, the remainder of our lifetime, we will never experience again after that point, um, Pluto in Capricorn. And during the uh, mid, you know, later part of the 1700s, they were, it was going back and forth, right? So I, I went back and looked a little bit just briefly to see, oh, what was that? What was happening then that's happening now? You know, what was similar then that is now? We, because so much of what we see in terms of our ancestry and cycles and life cycles is that there are things that pervade us, you know, through lifetimes and through generations. And there are things that, you know, we're, we're working with for a long time, right? And then there are phases of our lives where we graduate from things, right? You are not maybe in high school anymore. I don't know. I, I'm pretty sure that my average audience age is above high school age. <laughs> maybe there are some young ones watching, but I doubt it. Um, you know, but so there was a time and place for being a teenager and being in high school. And then you graduated from high school and maybe you went on, you know, maybe you went on to college, maybe you didn't. But that these are very Saturnian elements of time, right? We go through particular experience, lessons, tests in our life. We face various different challenges evolution is ancestral it you know the span that pluto takes to go all the way around the zodiac 248 years right 20 years roughly in a sign in any given sign um but we never experience a pluto return in our lifetime in these bodies if you believe in souls having reincarnation then of course maybe you did have a lifetime where in the 1700s you were living and um experienced the the last maybe you did experience the last pluto in aquarius ingress and so i started to think about the things that have been coming to mind for me because I'm very aware while the nodes are currently in the signs of Aries and Libra, and they're ruled by Mars and Venus respectively right now, I can feel the undercurrent of the nodal shift into Pisces Virgo already beginning in this time. And I think it's predominantly because of the presence of Saturn and Neptune in Pisces that I'm really aware of and present to this particular undercurrent um, that has to do with our faith and our devotion. And I've been talking a lot um, in the weeks ahead about my, my faith crises, my faith inquiries, my personal reflections, 
And also my call to pilgrimage, my call. And interestingly enough, right, I'm called to the south of France. And uh, the French were, the French, the British, you know, the United States, the all of the political revolutions. France is home to many of the monuments that are, um, and home to many of the artists that were specifically quite famous during that period of time, during the period of Pluto in um, Aquarius. M many of the novelists, the writers, you know, it, it were a lot of the creation and the creativity was coming out of um, Europe was coming out of the, the war that was happening and the revolution that was happening for the people both for the common people you know the revolutions that were happening in um you know gaining independence the united states gaining independence as its own nation sovereign from you know british rule um which later led you know to wars that pertain to the end of slaver slavery and the abolishment of that in the United States, but that the, all this was this revolution was progressive, right? People, Pluto and Capricorn, people were very dominated by the systems of oppression that were controlling their lives, and those systems of oppression, which at that time were the the monarchy, colonization, colonialism, still in part. We just, colonialism sort of replaced capitalism. The patriarchy as it in its religious connotation has been replaced by other forms of patriarchy, right? Um, people are not as controlled by religion as they are these days controlled by consumerism um, or consumption or social dictates social norms, right? So we see some of those similar things. And I think one of the things that's interesting is in those early times, um, Chiron was also in Aries. And when Pluto was originally moving into Aquarius, there was um, can Cancer Capricorn nodes at that time. And we did see a time after that where um, Jupiter was in Cancer. We did see a time after Pluto's ingress into Aquarius where Uranus was in Gemini. We will see that again in the coming years. There, there are repetitions that we will be seeing. So I'm, and a part of what has been interesting to me to reflect on is how does this axis, which we're facing in this week, and this is, I, I'm going to try and focus on the week ahead, but. How does this shift evolutionarily affect our lives, right? We're moving from Cancer Capricorn, Cancer being the polarity point of Pluto, to Aquarius Leo. And what's been so alive for my own inquiry is how does this change our sense of connection to the larger community. I hear a lot of people talking about wanting to be more involved in community, wanting to be more connected. I also, I, I'm very aware that there's like political, um, you know, processes coming down the line this year, right? Which will be later in November for the United States at least. And so we have that, the undercurrent of like political unrest, political revolution. Um, but what that, what was interesting to me to, was to go back and look and see who were the artists during that time? What were they painting? Who were the writers during that time? What, what were they writing? What were their words about? Because these modes of expression, especially the difference that we're seeing right now between individual expression, real creative expression, raw personal creative expression and artificial intelligence, right? 
are some of the really tricky themes. The, the needs that we have as collective people to be cared for and protected and the, ramic the ramifications of economics, um, of finances, of, you know, both globally and personally, right? Um, global economic situations affect vast majorities of people differently, right? People who have been economically oppressed will experience the extreme of even more. People who have been on the verge of economic depression will be pushed over. And one of the things I read today was an, a newsletter from a local woman who has been taking action here to create housing for the homeless in my community. And she was able through a lot of volunteers and a lot of community effort to build these little tiny houses on a vacant lot here in town and provide housing. And of course they've had to have, there's been lots of trials and there's been issues that they've faced with, um, you know, obviously communities of homelessness have issues with addiction and mental health issues. And there are, you know, anger management issues that some of their clients have experienced and, and she was describing, though, in her newsletter while facing all these different challenges that they've been facing, that more and more she's finding that people are coming to them who are recently homeless, who are not of the category that you would normally constitute as being homeless, right? Not someone who's been living on the streets their whole lives, not someone who has a drug abuse problem or has been in and out of jail. Like these are people with jobs. These are people who have no addiction issues. They may be people with children. They are, um, but they have been pushed by the current economy into a state of homelessness because, well, right. Jupiter and Taurus on some level, right. Rising rates of inflation relative to the cost of housing, relative to the cost of living, right? Food prices going up, gas prices going up, right? Jupiter, material resources, commodities that we all rely upon for nourishment, Venus, that we would use our Venus money, even the cost of discretionary spending, right? And think about that word, discretionary spending. It's, something that you can choose to do because you have choice, because you have freedom, because you have liberty. It's extra money that you're not needing to use to pay for rent, to pay for food. Basic survival needs are not discretionary spending, right? So Jupiter and Taurus, right? reflecting to that, the rising cost of housing, the cost of living, Things becoming so overinflated that normal people who have good, stable working jobs, who are hardworking, who have no mental health issues, no alcohol addiction issues, are finding themselves in a state of homelessness. And as someone who, you know, had a period of time in my life where as a single mom, I did find myself without housing and was, you know, the benefactor of my conditions, right? The benefactor of being a white woman in a, in a upper middle class community, I didn't have to declare myself as homeless during that time. And it was, but it, I experienced what it was like to live in a state of housing insecurity, in a state of food insecurity, without job or economic resources, without savings, without family, without people to bail me out from that situation, right? And so when we're living, what and what that did, what that experience did for me, one, it, um, I developed an immense amount of uh, psychological, emotional, and physical resilience through the the experience of that um, process, but it also brought me face to face 
with what it's like to live in a deep state of fear, right? And a deep state of financial insecurity. And I, I developed an immense amount of compassion for what it's like and appreciation, right? Gratitude for everything that, for the fact of, you know, um, here I am and I get to live in this place. And also economically, I can see this, it's unsustainable, right? It's unsustainable what we're facing in this world. And that's where evolution comes in. Because when the status quo, right, when when it's become a status quo to continuously raise the price of housing, raise interest rates, charge people more. Um, and this happens even in the spiritual communities, right? I've seen the price of spiritual classes and services go up. And I've even witnessed in my own life of how like I need to charge more for what I'm doing in order to sustain, right? Where the more has to become more on every single level. And I can feel inside myself, I want to opt out from this, from participating in this more, but there isn't yet infrastructure in my life to be able to disengage completely from the system and be able to um, not participate in it. And yet on some level, I don't want to participate in it. So there's this conflict of evolution, right? And a part of the realization that I had earlier today is like, if we are living simply, if we have surrendered our need for things outside of us, right? If we've even given up the things that we desire for, right? I desire for the nice clothing or I desire for the expensive linen sheets or I desire for the delicious restaurant food, right? We can have lots of desires, right? And Jupiter can be the over expansion of our desires in the realm of physical material pursuits, right? If I'm only pursuing those to my detriment, then at the end of the month, at the end of the year, and there's no resources left, and there's not enough money to pay rent, and there's not enough, and there's no savings in the bank, and economically, people are feeling more tight because there's so much pressure, right? Again, this is what brings us to the edge of where the status quo becomes exhausted, whether it's the status quo within our consciousness of like, oh, I just feel like I can't live this way anymore, whether it's the status quo within culture or society or societal norms, right? The evolutionary push is the push to move beyond the point where we have been before. And let's think about where we are right now, um, where Pluto at the ninth degree of Capricorn, we have Mars in Capricorn, we have um, Mercury, who's recently moved into Capricorn. And Mercury is still not even cleared its shadow from its retrograde. So the all the way to eight degrees Capricorn is the Mercury retrograde. So this is what I consider the resolution phase of the Mercury retrograde, right? The, the pre-shadow is the phase when the things, the stuff is coming in. The things are often even breaking down in the pre-shadow phase. Right then, the retrograde phase itself is the breakdown, right? And and the need to rework, the need to redirect, right? Redirecting what the structures of our lives, um, and then the the last phase is the post retrograde shadow, where. We're resolving and moving through the resolution. Things are sometimes like things are coming back to us and clearing out and finalizing, being finalized, being finally resolved or being rectified, right? And the longer and the deeper a planet's retrograde, the deeper meaning the more internalized the function of the soul work relative to that retrograde cycle, um, you know, 
So Mercury's retrograde is relatively quickly, right? It's three weeks of cycle and it's total, you know, pre-shadow and then three weeks of retrograde and then post-shadow, you know, it's not, it's not, and it happens three times a year. So it's frequent and relatively common. Whereas Pluto's retrograde is long and slow, covers very few degrees back and forth for six months out of the year, half the time, deeper, right? Soul evolutionary work happening in those particular retrograde cycles. Uranus is very close to the end of its retrograde cycle. Juno, the goddess of um, marriage, commitment, and um, our our constitution of the uh, the counterpart to Jupiter, she just stationed retrograde recently. Um, so Mars is in Capricorn. Uh, this is from Jeffrey Wolf Green, the function and nature of Mars. Mars in Capricorn will correlate to a soul that desires to penetrate and set free all causes of personal inhibitions, constraints, restraints, and repressions. As such, this placement reflects a soul who desires to unlock the cell door of their inner prison so that the light of personal freedom can shine, a freedom that is not limited by moralistic or religious conditions that can create an uneasy guilt and attempts to control instinctual impulses from the soul. Um, right, that authoritarian... That mechanism, right? And Saturn is in Pisces. So where where we have been controlled, in particular, by a universal benefactor who was all-punishing, all-powerful, deeply repressive, and rejecting of our true nature, right? That's that's a lot of the God that we've been conditioned to believe in. There's even, there are passages in the Bible that I particularly struggle with, which one uh, in one in particular is a, is where it says um, God is a jealous God, right? And the image I get is that of a man writing, you know, a man, a man who is a jealous man or a woman who is a jealous man, woman, um, you know, because jealousy is not limited to the genders. Jealousy can is an emotion that anyone can experience. And I it's something I've struggled with in my own life, you know, many times. Right. But what is it? What does jealousy speak to a relative sense of inadequacy or inferiority, a sense of I'm not good enough. Right. And I can't get behind the idea that there that God thinks that they're not good enough, or that God needs to be possessive of their creations, right? The all powerful creator, the creator of all, is all, holds all, knows all. And, you know, so it's kind of like that's pointing to. Someone else wrote the story. Someone else narrated. And of course, any narrator, including myself, right? I'm I am I am the narrator of these a week ahead. And a part of what I'm channeling or what I'm expressing, what what comes through my own expression is my own lens, which includes my distortions, it includes my perceptions, my projections, and it includes the stories that I've been taught and the things that I'm still healing, the places where um, I meet my own inadequacy, my own judgments. And I try to be as transparent as possible with y'all about that as a part of the expression of whatever I share, you know, on this channel. But, you know, what we're working with from a soul perspective is a part of that liberation Right, and Mars already made its trying to Jupiter in the last couple of days. Um, I didn't talk about that last week, so I'll just point that out here. See, Mars trying Jupiter right after this new moon that we had in Capricorn, right? Very powerful new moon. Last new moon ever with Pluto. 
Never again will that happen in our lifetime. We will have still lunation time, lunar time. The moon will still move through Capricorn when Pluto's in Capricorn, but we will never have the sun and the moon together in our lifetime. And I think I pointed that out. So we, we got these like ending cycles here. We've got Mars in there really wanting to break through the deeper conditioning patterns of our soul that is um, stuck, right? This is a stuckness where we haven't yet been liberated from our own belief systems. That's those belief systems coming from patriarchal conditioning, from past conditioning, from ancestral conditioning, Wherever that conditioning, oppressionary, colonial conditioning, right? This is a deconditioning of all souls that is happening. And a part of what I kept trying to get myself to <laughs> saying about this evolutionary process is that the status quo is going to keep pushing us up against those limitations. And we're going to have to find ways to break free. And a part of where evolution can happen naturally is through the breakdown, right? The breakdown of those structures. We have caterpillar time. We're in caterpillar time right now. Caterpillar time, cocoon time, the whole dissolving process. And I would say the 29th degree of any sign has that dissolving energy. It has that being wound up into the, the dis disillusionment because as much as the new phase, whether it's Baslamic, it's a closing cycle, or it's new phase, like here, we're in the new phase of the lunar cycle, it's an opening lunar cycle, those early times in the end of the end and the beginning of the beginning have less to do about what we can see about the nature of our reality, how we're thinking, and more to do with the breakdown or the ending of multiple realities simultaneously. And, you know, going back to the 1700s, um, there was a whole liberation that was happening, right? And new people were being formed, a new government was being formed, but actually like the dis complete destruction of the native people of the Americas, right? That's not necessarily talked about everywhere but that is a really important like the enslavement of people of color and also what white um in B british colonial times white there were white and black slaves in fact the laws that were or originally made around marriage had to do with creating a distinction of whiteness in order to make sure that white and black slaves could not marry that's what it was all about. That word was created for that purpose. So from like, all, there's all this historical context that frames and sets the life that we're living in today. The laws for marriage are the same laws that were constructed in the 1700s, at least if you're living in the United States, right? That's the framework that is in a process of dissolving right now. It's in a process of being worn out. Not to say that the not to say that marriage itself, the union of two people with God, the commitment of beloveds with their source and their creator, and the commitment to care for one another, right? Kinship, care for, to care for in good health and bad, right? Nobody wants to be in a relationship where I'm you only get to be loved if you got if you're having a good hair day. You only get to be in that relationship if, if you're financially well off. Let me be with you only when you've got money. But when you don't, when you're sick, when you're not well, I'm not there. I can't do that. I'm sorry. Right? There is some aspects of those vows that were pointing to a kinship, a caring for but they were also written in a time where women were the possessions of their fathers or of slave owners or and their value was determined by the number of children that they could have how well they could care for a household there was distinctions of whether or not people could, were you know owned 
um, and whether they could marry, right? So there are a lot of social constructs that are commonplace, even though for the majority these days, people get married because they love each other. That wasn't the case in the 1700s. People weren't, It w that was a liberation from the norm to marry someone because of love. It wasn't the norm. And it certainly wasn't a part of the marriage contract, right? The seventh house is the house of contracts. That includes business contracts. That includes, it's anyone that's not the other, right? And the eighth house is the house of intimate re resources. It's a house of death and taxes because we would get taxed there. We would have resources. We would have inheritance. We would have money. And money matters that were intimate matters, the same things you didn't talk about money and you didn't talk about being in the bedroom. You didn't share your sexual fantasies or your sexual proclivities outside of marriage, and you didn't share resources outside of marriage. So right, all these huge, big evolutionary themes of our lives, <laughs> are pushing up to the surface as we have this, you know, Pluto coming to the edge of Capricorn, the sun coming to the edge of Capricorn, kind of pushing us. Venus is going to come in here in um, Sagittarius. She's currently in mutual reception to Jupiter. That means she's ruled by Jupiter and Jupiter is ruled by Venus. He's in her sign. She's in his sign. Um, and you know, she's going to square Neptune this week. That's a big part of this whole dissolving process. We could almost say caterpillars entering cocoons at this time, right? Some of us, some of us are going to be in deep, deep internal processes and, and intimate processes of dissolving within our own lives and our own structures and our own realities. And on some level, deep liberations from conditioned ways of being and believing and limitations, right? Limitations that we've been up against, things that have been holding us back from living our best lives, from being our best selves. And a part of what I've been really thinking about are what are the three ways in which, what are the three places where our power lies? Because Pluto is all about core power as a soul, right? And the, the cooperation with source, the cooperation to return to source, which is to re return to the essential, unconditionally loving nature Right. And I think for me in my own path with my spirituality and my faith, the thing I come back to again and again and again is I can only believe in an all loving God, in an all loving source. And I'm getting myself out of the way of some of that conditioning, which is like the punitive, punishing, um, jealous God, which is the elements of a distorted masculine, a distorted, a patriarchal distortion of the masculine that is not what the masculine is all about. The, the true essence of the masculine is to provide, to protect, to care for. It's a, actually a very nourishing cancer element of the masculine. That provision is what allows the feminine to be receptive, to be safe, to be vulnerable, which is also an element of the feminine. And all of those things are what allows life to continue to flourish and regenerate, right? We have this, we, we can have a regenerative relationship with the earth, with our resources, with our relationships, or we can have depletive re you know, relationships. And a part of the toxic masculine culture and the toxic feminine culture, and the, actually the, just the removal of even that word, toxicity, um, from our language, from our vocabulary about one another, because frankly, anyone 
can behave badly, even the best of people. You know, Gandhi was said to have been a a, a sexist, you know, um, right? The most celebrated non Mar Martin Luther King, who it happens to be his day of celebration, he was assassinated, you know, for what he stood for. And he was also said to have been um unfaithful to his wife, you know, and um a womanizer, you know. So every even the most celebrated, beloved, spiritual, idealized people are human people, right? Human people. That means that we we get angry, we make mistakes. Human people, human hurt people, hurt people, right? And we have a, a we have essentially a pretty traumatized world on our hands that's in the process of a long term nervous system rehabilitation. We have a pretty distorted culture, um, consumerized culture that is in the process of a long term evolutionary shift. That could bring us to a state of actual kinship, right? More community, more connection, more we have to take care of each other through sickness and health, through good times and bad. Less reliance on the government to provide for us and take care of us. More reliance on the village. More reliance on our peers, our friends, our communities. Who do you have in your life where when you're not able to take care of yourself, you can go to, right? I don't have, I I mean, maybe I have more people than I think of, but for me, a lot of the people that I've had to rely upon, on, you know, so a lot of the people who really helped me get through the most difficult times in my life, friends, strangers, my parents, neighbors, um, government support, anonymous people, and some anonymous angels help me more than, and I will never know who they are or be able to thank them. Wow. Um, church people, the church ladies helped me so much when I was pregnant with my first daughter, you know, gave me so much hope. Help me say yes to things that I didn't know how to do by myself. Um, so it's like these these times in particular, they are evolving us because the status quo of our lives, the challenges that we face, the fears that we face, the financial insecurities that we face, the dissolving, the economic changes, they are necessary to the revolution, to the evolution of the whole world, right? So they're not, even if they are personal, right? Because we do have personal planets, personal planets, Venus, Mars, Mercury. I would even say the goddesses, the moon. The, the goddesses to me are personal facets of personal planets. And then we have outer planets, right? Evolutionary planets, revolutionary planets, Uranus, Pluto, Neptune. Um, all right. I'm on the fence around Saturn, I think is kind of like the edge of reality, the edge of the personal, um, all right. Cause Saturn dictates form and structure and Saturn's an immutable sign right now. Changes of form and structure, right? To what? Pisces, everything, the whole, the whole, the end of the end, right? But we're only in the very beginnings of that. I think we'll see changes to our mental health structures, especially during this time, because what do we need to do? We need to be able to ground into medicines that are deeply healing. We need to be able to get out of pain, and out of pain from what disassociating from our feelings, from our emotions, and into being able to feel and heal and forgive and resolve the past, right? And here we have Chiron, which is a repetition of a cycle. Chiron was also 
in Aries during the time when Pluto was also in Capricorn. And um, the whole, you know, issues that we face around war and violence are, right, these are healing. And um, I, when in one of my ceremonies, I received the message that, you know, war would not exist in countries where the feminine was not oppressed, right? And a part of what I looked back at in terms of looking back at these cycles is that, you know, so many of the known artists, obviously there would have been women artists, the known artists, the known poets, the known authors of those times were not women, very few. And the, if they were women, they were distinguished women. They were women who had freedoms and rights that were afforded to them because of their status. And there's very little that, you know, a woman who was living, right? When we're living in a state of survival, we can't think about art. We can't think about creation. We can't think about doing things beyond just making sure that we have the bare necessities. And of course, the woman's, you know, especially for the feminine, the responsibility to care for creations, right? That would be caring for children, feeding my children, caring for my children, housing my children would be first and foremost above any other thing before anything else, right? Before we get to think about art and pleasure and adventure and travel, right? These are the, uh, the hierarchy of needs I'm talking about, you know? And these are some of the energetics that we're working with in these particular times, how we're working through um, fears that we might have relative to relationships that might be coming to an end, relative to uh, situations that might be coming to an end, re relative to financial sources of support and nourishment, how we use our resources, relative to all of this. And it comes down to where do we have our power? Where do we have our power? Well, we have it in three places that I've been able to identify. We have power in our choice. That is, that when it comes down to it, sometimes can just be the choice of our own perspective, how we think, where we're directing our mind, what we choose to focus upon. We have power in our desires. Our desires, ultimately, the desire of the soul to return to source, that is the deepest calling but our desires are a big source of power. And um, we have we have power in our decisions, like what we decide to do, right? That's the choice one. And there is one other source of power. Anyway, so the, like as we're moving through this week, I'm kind of facing the... Uh, the work, really, what is the work of that Mars in Aries? I'm focusing a lot on that Mars in Aries because Mars is leading the way in front of Venus. Mars is in Capricorn, um, the ruler of the North Node. The moon's going to apply to Chiron and then to the North Node. We have this Aries moon, right? This can help us initiate change, take action. We're in, and, and it's in a new lunar cycle. We can be getting things done and moving things forward in our life and what we might be struggling with of course over abundance of energy over like don't overdo it don't forget to rest don't forget you know too much um too much mars too much yang energy right all of these polarities require the polarity for integration. So when I'm talking about Aries, well, what does it require? Libra, peace, diplomacy, relationships, harmony, balance, right? Connection. What's the opposite of Taurus? Scorpio, deep depth, intimacy, right? Water, emotion, to balance Taurus, embodiment, physical, 
energies? What's the polarity of um, Capricorn, cancer, nourishment, protection, care, the womb? What is the polarity of Aquarius, Leo, expression, sovereignty, um, joy? Children are an expression of Leo, right? What's the polarity of Pisces, Virgo? Discernment, right? Discernment around what we do with our time, our resources. What are we committed to? What are we really doing with, um, what's the pleasure in our life really for, right? Joy is resiliency boosting for sure. Pleasure is um, going to give us something, is it giving, is it regenerative? Is it something that gives us more energy? Is it something that takes energy from us? We can be asking ourselves these questions because a part of what we're redefining in this dissolving process is what and who we are in the world. What and who, what we do in the world. And that's the other place of power, our purpose. That's the third one. Oh, thank God I remembered. Our purpose. And if the essential purpose that we have as human beings is to love and be loved, what are we doing? What are we doing to fulfill that essential purpose? You know, if that's the bottom line for who you are and what you are in the world, what are we doing that on a bottom line daily basis nourishes that purpose. What if we have other purposes? Of course, we can have all kinds of purposes, right? Sometimes we're looking for like soul purpose, like purpose with a capital P. And other times we're looking for a purpose of like, help me, uh, put me to work, idle hands, you know, give me something to do with my life, right? And whatever spectrum we're on in terms of looking for a purpose, those are the sources of power, our choice, our purpose, and our desire. And if those three things come together, holy moly, watch out world. <laughs> because look what you might do with yourself. Oh, it makes me want to cry. How much joy I already feel for you. <laughs> you know, if you're doing something, if your purpose is to love and be loved, right? And you're absolutely committed to that purpose. And in, in commitment to that purpose, your desire is to love and be loved. <laughs> and you are, oh my God, this makes me so like fill with joy. <laughs> and your choice, your choices are loving and being loving. <laughs> wow the world could only benefit from who you are and what you're doing in the world. And like, I want to know you and celebrate you. Let me know who you are. <laughs> Let me know what you're doing in the world. I want to walk together with you. Um, Yeah. I mean, it's like, that's, there is no higher meaning. And the whole, the whole thing of being a human being, of being souls of being incarnated beings is that we're looking for meaning. <laughs> we're searching for meaning. And if the purpose and if all of the places where we derive power, our desires, our choice, and our purpose all come together for the central meaning that we're here to live as love, that is going to change the world, my friends. That's probably enough to do in this week. If there's anything that you can do... And obviously this is all practice. This is all work. This And the work that we're ultimately doing sometimes is getting out of the way of that conditioning, that old conditioning that has taught us not to have a purpose that is love, that has taught you to have a very uh, functional purpose or a purpose that can be commodified or a purpose that, you know, can be controlled. Or we've been 
doing something, someone else's purpose, somebody else's desire. We've been following somebody else's desires. We've been wanting what somebody else wants, not what we want, you know, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong. You know, I'm not judging. I do that too, right? That's a part of that Libra South node. And you know, everything is resolving through that Libra South node. So where we've learned to do that in relationship, we're healing that, you know, when I was a little girl and my dad would ask me, um, you know, what do you want for dinner? I would say, I don't know. What do you want? But, you know, as I become more and more, I'm like, oh, no, I'm really clear about what I want, especially when it comes to food. Like, usually if I'm not clear about what I want to eat, it's because something's going on with me that I need to, like, reconnect with myself. And maybe that's what we're needing to do on some level is also reconnect with who we are. And in that dissolving process that I'm talking about, you might not know who you are and that's okay too. And so as we're moving through this, we're moving into this first quarter trine, which I think is a wave of energy that moves from this deep Mars energy into this deep Taurus energy into this expansive air energy, right? Before the um before we get to so the first the sun enters Aquarius. This is going to be a longer week ahead and I'm sorry folks, but hopefully you enjoy the whole thing. Listen all the way to the end, please. <laughs> then Pluto enters Aquarius, right? January 21st. Um this is a big wave of energy. As the sun, as the moon and Vesta, you know, are opposing Venus. Venus is going to make an opposition. Um, and Venus is going to be then in the galactic center, right? The last degree of Sagittarius before she moves in to the sign of Capricorn. So. I'll save her movement into the sign of Capricorn for next week. Um, this Pluto sun conjunction, very powerful, very powerful initiation cycle, right? Look, sun goes first. Sun joins Pluto. Wow. This polarity point deeply activated. Everything I talked about this week in terms of our physical financial resources, right? And the liberation that we are each endeavoring to do to become more of who we truly are, right? That's the excavation process. That's the long-term process. It's always a process of titration and integration and learning. We're learning lessons. We're learning self-discipline. We're learning self-mastery. We're learning how to heal ourselves. We're learning how to be balanced in our energy. We're learning... Um, how to heal the wounds, right? Of that, of that, um, you know, distorted masculine, right? And we're lean, we're learning to heal the wounds of jealousy, of overexpansion, of seeking energy, right? The distortions of that. We're learning to heal the wounds of religious ideas and cultures and dogmas, in particular, that have suppressed the feminine, denied the truth, um, suppressed our identities, not allowed us to be who we truly are created to be as our created creator created us. And then as you know, all of this comes into the sign of Aquarius, the polarity point moves to Leo. We will be learning what it means to initiate self-expression that is about joy. And I really do believe it comes down to those three things, my friends, our passion, our purpose, and our, our desires, our purpose, and our choice coming together as one and united with the love that we are and that making the world of difference in the world. So as you're doing that, um, please, you know, feel free to join me in the journey of working together in a deeper way. My calendar is open for sessions. You can book a session with me if you want to work one-on-one. -on -one. 
Um, my program for the year rebirth is open for enrollment. You can sign up on a monthly subscription or pay for the whole year. If you want to join me for the whole year, I'm thinking of opening up, um, segments in shorter little bursts. Um, that may be a possibility. There's scholarship opportunities and there are free resources on my website. And of course, ways that in which if you need financial support to join me, like evolution doesn't have to be an alone job. It doesn't have to be, um, you know, draining. It can be a regenerative experience. And I really do believe that as we grow together, we grow together, right? That's my program. Um, one of my programs, Rebirth, which is focused on this evolutionary journey and growing together, and growing together is all about rising up together and really sharing our work and our our medicine with the world and being our best selves and growing. And so you can join me for that. If you have any questions, as always, you can always email me, astrologywithmichelle at gmail.com. And leave me your voice, your heart. Let me know your thoughts, how you're finding those three things in your life and finding your way. Always love, even your just emojis. Love your comments, my friends. So grateful to be on this journey with you. And bye for now.